Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Uh, we make a point once a year to honor our fathers. That's a shame, isn't it? Once a year, honor our fathers. Um, many of you know for years I refused to go to church on Father's Day. Um, Seems like the one day a year that we choose to honor our fathers is the one day a year that pastors choose to come down on the fathers for not doing a better job. That's garbage. I want to read some stats to you, okay? You can verify any of these stats online. Didn't take me very long to come up with these. If anything, these estimates are conservative, okay? Um, 1960, only 10% of children were raised without a father in the home. Today, conservative estimates put it at 40%. Almost one out of every two. Just over half of the births among millennials, millennials being that age that is now child-rearing age, uh, just over half of the births among them are to unwed mothers. Only about half of millennials believe a child needs a home with both a father and a mother present to grow up happily. We have a paradigm shift in the way we think. So I want to uh, talk just a little bit today about how important, how valuable fathers are. Okay? Now, first thing that we need to understand is, as Christians, this is the basis whereby we come to all of our conclusions, regardless of how they look in a cultural setting. Okay? Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to back up for just a second. I have one thing I want to say before we get into this, and I'll tie it right back in. Um, Orlando, Florida. I am so disappointed with the Christians that I've seen responding to that tragedy in Orlando. Because I have seen more Christians whining and griping and complaining about their stupid gun rights than I have about Christians wailing for the loss of lives in eternity. 49 people gave up their lives that day. I'm not God, but I'm going to estimate the majority of whom are now separated from their Heavenly Father for eternity. And people are worried about their guns. It's time to give up this, this false prioritization that people have, this, this lie that our culture propagates, that somehow things are more important than people. When Jesus gave us the Great Commission, He didn't say anything in there about our guns. Now don't get me wrong, I have guns. I like guns. I like to shoot guns. I'm not very good at it. It just means I get to shoot more. Because <laughs> it takes me longer to hit the target. So I'm not decrying, I'm not calling foul on guns. I'm calling foul on priorities. The Great Commission is set up to go and make disciples. Not to go and proclaim your rights. Okay? So we, we've got to get out of this Americanized thinking that our rights somehow supersede God's will, His desire. So, that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to wrap right back in here to fathers. Children of fathers are less likely to live in poverty. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 44% of children in mother-only families were living below the poverty level, compared to 12% with a household headed by a married couple, mother and father. The U.S. Department of Health reports similar numbers 
saying that uh, mothers with no father raising children have a poverty rate of 47.6%. Children with fathers do better in school. 2001 study by the Department of Education showed that students whose fathers were highly involved in their lives were 43% more likely to receive A's. So it's, it's not just having a dad, it's having a father that's involved. 43% more likely. They also said that children of fathers who read tended to read more. <clears throat> this, this number here, biological step, surrogate, as long as there was a father of some sort involved, that number applies. Children without fathers are more likely to do jail time. One estimate had it at 80% of incarcerated prisoners grew up with a absentee father or no father at all. Adolescents, um, children without fathers are more likely to smoke to drink alcohol, to use drugs, by a magnitude of 400%. Children without fathers are more likely to be sexually active as teenagers. A recent study showed that involved dads have twice the amount of influence as moms on reducing teen sex. I had a Thing that I, I wanted to implement my wife chose not to but when my boys turned 12 years old I was gonna staple them <laughs> when they got married their wedding present would be a staple removal that would take care of all concerns Christy vetoed that I'm still she has not convinced me that that wasn't the better route <clears throat> but when you have a father that you know is watching a father that's involved in your life, you are 50% less likely to be involved in sex. Children with fathers, this one surprised me, children with fathers tend to have a larger vocabulary. Now this is kind of a backhanded compliment because, no, 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 it's not four letter words. No, I know every one of you thought that. No. The reason is because moms tend to be more involved in the daily progress of their children's vocabulary. Mothers tend to speak to the relative age of the child. Fathers don't. Fathers have no clue what the relative vocabulary of the child is. So they use big words expecting the child is going to understand. <laughs> Thus, the children develop better vocabularies. I thought that was kind of cool. It's a kind of a backhanded thing to fathers, but it works. But then the kids don't know what the words mean. Oh, but they look them up and they go ask mom. <laughs> and you better hope they're not four-letter words. <laughs> Couple other figures. Fathers, uh, uh, children with fathers gain many additional benefits to health and happiness. This, the grant study, this was the longest study um, longitudinal uh, ever done in the lives of men. These are the things that they came up with. Children with fathers have an enhanced capacity to play. Actually, there was a sub-article that came off of this that talked about how children with fathers in the home tend to roughhouse. And that tends to be a good thing because it teaches them how to handle their aggressive tendencies <clears throat> appropriately and not cause problems. Um, Vivian shared a story at uh, the women's Bible study that Christy came home and shared with me, and I, I can't remember his name. It was Angus, right? Angus Buchan. If any of you saw Faith Like Potatoes, this is the gentleman that that movie is based on. He was uh, sharing, it was on TBN? Yes. Okay. I'm going to let you share what he told, so I don't completely mess it up. <laughs>
and the story of the young bull elephants who were beginning to run wild and gang up and tear up the whole refuge over in South Africa. And the gamekeepers didn't know what to do. And someone uh, came by and asked them, where are the old bulls with the long tusks and huge tracks? And they said, we put them away in a place to care for them. They were uh, being... Uh, they were being killed for their tusks. Uh, they were told to bring them back. And when they did, a few weeks, Later, the young bulls settled down in peace. The old set the example. And this story is true, and I heard it from his own mouth, from Angus Buffett, a, a Scottish evangelist, an old man. Now, awesome, and it's true. So that the gamekeepers trying to preserve the bull elephants, the ones with the tusks that were being poached for their ivory, they had separated them out to keep them safe. And what they found was that in the herds, the young bulls had no idea what was considered appropriate behavior. But once those old bulls came back in, they set the tone very quickly. This is an important note for men in the church. Even if your children, your biological children have grown up and moved out, even if you don't have biological children, you have the power to set the tone in the young men's lives around you. <clears throat> I'm going to read some more and then I want to come back and address that. Um, they have more enjoyment, children with fathers, have more enjoyment of vacations. They have a greater likelihood of being able to use humor as a healthy coping mechanism. They, are a, uh, they have a better adjustment to and contented with life after retirement. They are less likely, uh, excuse me, they experience less anxiety and fewer physical and mental symptoms under stress in young adulthood. These are just some of the statistics that I found. And each one of these that I read has document after document attesting to their validity. And keeping in mind that every one of these statistics, while Christian research has indicated this it is also non-christian research okay it's not like people are out there going oh yeah that's just because you're trying to float your own boat as christians no most of the studies that are done on this are not christian okay <clears throat> we see that god knew what he was doing when he created adam and he created eve and they became husband and wife and being husband and wife they became father and mother okay now there's a couple things that I want to share with you um, first <clears throat> I watch I'm, I'm a, I watch people I watch how people interact with each other uh, when I was a teenager I used to go to the mall by myself and I find a strategic point and I would just watch the people and people do the darndest things it's amazing one of the things that I always said that I would never do, and I've tried really hard not to do, is all throughout the mall, I would see these families walking. And dad would be set with a grim purpose, get in, get out, conquer, get home to the game. Mom has her shopping list and hands going eight different directions, keeping track of all the little ones and usually is following some significance behind, significant difference behind, while dad is completely oblivious. Dad has come to conquer. Mom has come to shop. <laughs> Children got brought along because we're gonna have a family outing. <laughs> just, just for the record, that's never a good idea, okay? You have two widely disparate concepts as to what shopping entails. <clears throat> Men shop, tools, guns meat. <laughs> Women shop clothes. Shoes. Which would be clothes. <laughs> okay? And, and their whole approach is, is very different. Just, just very different. I'm not a shopper, I'm a purchaser. I walk in, I find what I want, I leave. Amen. Okay? I'm done. 
and it's not that difficult. Tennis shoes, white. They go with anything, white. I need a pair of brown shoes, I need a pair of black shoes, and tennis shoes. Jeans, as long as they fit me. Christy, on the other hand, while she is not quite the shopper that some of our daughters-in-law are, Kayla. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, if you want a bargain, go with Kayla. You know what, I tell her just buy both of them because I'm tired of waiting. <laughs> but we went and, and Christy was looking for some pants and we had done some shopping in Walmart and, and I had a, a list of things that I still had to get and she said, well, I'm just gonna go look real quick. <laughs> real quick is a very relative term because she meant real quick compared to Kayla not compared to Glenn and I stood and I waited and I'm looking at the shoes and she dropped me off right by the ladies undergarments so I'm looking over this way at shoes and you know, Walmart just doesn't have a big selection of shoes. And after a while, I'm texting the kids to see if they need anything at Walmart. <laughs> She's still not back. Well, I can read some scripture. <laughs> She's still not back. All right, fine, I'm, I'm going to do the rest of my shopping. So I took off, I went to go get the rest of the, uh, I went and bought 80 boxes of cereal. <laughs> and she found me. She had no pants, no jeans. She didn't buy any of them. She said, I knew you'd probably be getting impatient, so I decided I'll come back and shop later. I said, do it with McKenzie. <laughs> now, God knew what he was doing when he created fathers. I appreciate very much what Dennis said. There's a, there's a, a note here that we need to keep in mind. Not all of you had good fathers. Some of you had really bad fathers. Fathers that did not parent well. All of us had fathers that, that made mistakes. Some of the mistakes were, were grievous. But God knew what he was doing. Because see, when God set this up, when he set up a father and a mother, he was setting up an illustration as to declare his place in our lives. And while just like all of the things that he set up in the Old, Old Testament are a reflection and an illustration of the reality that is in heaven, our examples are often flawed. But I watch, and I have watched for almost 12 years now, the, the fathers in this congregation, this family, and I, I look at the fathers that are, are old enough to be my father. And, and uh, you know, my father passed away a couple years ago. And a lot of times I turn and I look at Dennis for advice. And Dennis steps in and, and he kind of takes a surrogate father place for me. And I can always, I don't have to wonder what Dennis thinks. <laughs> Dennis just makes it very clear. All I got to do is ask. And sometimes I don't even have to ask. And he shares with me what's on his heart. He shares with me what he thinks about things. And, and I, I look at the children that, that they raised and, and I think, wow, what godly men. What, what the hand of God was in those families. And I look at the, the people of my generation whose children are just now getting into um, childbearing. And I, I look at those kids that I remember growing up and coming through youth group and, and now they're having families of their own and, and I see the, uh, the godly way that they're raising their children based on the example that their mom and dad set for them. And, and looking backward, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed and looking forward, I'm so pleased because I see the hearts that are driving these parental relationships. And, and I see the love that fathers and the involvement that the fathers in this congregation have with their kids. And, and even if they don't do it right all the time, they're doing it. 
It's never easy. We have five children. I have four boys and one girl. All four of the boys in one lump were much easier than the girl. <laughs> Not because she was difficult, she was different. If I had a question about how the boys felt about something, it didn't, it was pretty easy to figure out how they felt about things. You know, if they liked it, they didn't like it. If they liked it, and I asked them ten times, ten times they liked it. If they didn't like it, I asked them ten times, they didn't like it. I asked my daughter, and all ten times I'll get ten completely different answers. <laughs> she was different, and not, not better, not worse, just different. <clears throat> I, I share the story about my daughter. <clears throat> she, uh, we, we decided we were not going to raise her as a girly girl. We were going to let her choose. She wanted to be a girly girl. And so we didn't rush out and buy babies and foo-foo things and the little cute dresses and things like that. And, and she was not very old at all. And she went and she took one of the boys' army men, the G.I. Joe guy, and she wrapped it in a blanket and she was carrying it. <laughs> now this is the same daughter who had a can and a Barbie doll and she was playing in her high chair, can and Barbie doll, and they were talking back and forth and having a conversation. And all of a sudden something happened and things got heated. And wham, 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 wham. So that's the daughter I was expecting. <laughs> not better, not worse, just different. <laughs> So my daughter has always liked shoes. I don't, I don't get that. I really don't. I just, you know, shoes, they're just things to hide your ugly feet. Okay? So I don't really get the shoe thing. But she was, what, four years old? And we were driving in the van, and, and she just gone on and on about it. All these different kinds of shoes she wore. You're four years old. <laughs> when I was four years old, I didn't wear shoes. <laughs> Mom and Dad had to wrestle me down to put them on. <laughs> and she's going on. I finally I had enough. I said, "That's it." So we 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 get home. I am buying you a pair of boxing gloves. That's it. No more shoes. Boxing gloves. <laughs> and she got quiet. And she pondered for a little while. And she said in her little four-year-old, cute little girly voice. Could I have pink of them? <laughs> Fine, we'll get you shoes. <laughs> so let me let me just share with you some scriptures, okay? I just pulled some some scriptures out that I want to to put the emphasis on fathers, okay? Exodus chapter twenty, verse twelve. This is. In the list of Ten Commandments that, that God had given Israel. Okay? Honor your father and your mother. Now, honor is a, a tricky thing, isn't it? Because what one may think is honoring, the other may not. And so it, it's one of those things that you kind of have to learn what honor looks like to the person. Um, for example, my wife is very honored when people give her cards. Cards to me are just fancy paper. And, and she, it took me a long time to realize she really likes the cards. As a matter of fact, it took me to the point where she had to say, I like cards, because that's how quick I am. And I went, oh, maybe she wants cards. And so I told the kids, you know, every Mother's Day, make sure you get her a card. Even, you know, you get her a present, that's fine, but make sure there's a card. And so every Mother's Day she gets cards. I don't care about cards. I'm, I'm indifferent. I look at them and go, oh, okay. Now, I am much more content with a handwritten note than I am with a Hallmark card. Okay, that, so when, when the kids present Christy with cards, that's very honoring to her. To me, I'm indifferent. So honor means something very different from one to the other, okay? But he says, honor your father and your mother. And then he says something really cool. He says that your, may, your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Okay, this is, this is the first of the Ten Commandments that we have, that, that there's a promise that goes with it. But now see, I'm, I'm going to jump way ahead to Malachi. Because God says something kind of interesting in Malachi. Ah, as soon as I... 
Turn my paper here. Malachi chapter 4. This is the prophecy of the coming Elijah. Okay? Very end of the book of Malachi. God speaking through Malachi, uh, chapter 4, verse 6. He's speaking about, about um, Elijah, and he says, And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Do you think the father-child dynamic is important to God? Look at that verse again. It is so important that he says that I'm going to turn the hearts of the father to their children and the children to their fathers. Because if this doesn't happen, I will utterly destroy the land. Now you look, God often speaks in blessings and cursings, doesn't he? And it's, it's not so much that God sits up there willy-nilly and decides what pleases him and what doesn't please him. It's the way he designed things. He integrated into the design the blessings and the cursings. Okay? And if you do those things that God has designed you to do with a plan and a purpose, you're blessed. But if you don't, the natural outcome of that is the, the taking away the blessing, which is a curse. You receive the opposite of the blessing, the curse. Okay? So when God established the father-child relationship, he thought it was so important that he interwove into the very fiber of that relationship both a blessing and a curse. Okay? It's that important. All right? Let's, let's look at a couple other verses here. <clears throat> Just kind of working our way forward. Well, actually, I'm going backward because I jumped ahead to Malachi. But we're going to go backwards now. <clears throat> um, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. This is the Shema. This is the, the, the greatest commandment. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then this is immediately followed by what Jesus says is the greatest command. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then listen to what comes next. Okay? This is all part of the same thought, the same progression. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit at your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your head, and they shall be as a front look between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now the key thing right in there that we need to pick up on, you shall teach them diligently to your children. One of the things that really blesses me is when I talk with the children of this church, Almost without fail, they are well versed in the scriptures. Wow. And, and I mean such that sometimes I will ask them difficult questions. They can pop off the answers. They know the word. And that is huge. I think that speaks well to our Sunday school program, but I think it speaks very well of the parents in this church. Excellent job, mothers and fathers. Very well done. Joshua 24. This is uh, Joshua's last words before he passes away. Verse 15, he says, And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Here again is that weird dynamic, the blessing and the curse. Okay. Now what, what Joshua is referring to here is they've just come out of Egypt. They've spent 40 years in the desert. Okay, They're coming into the promised land. They've, they've conquered the majority of it. And he's at the end of his life. And he's kind of just laying before them. Kind of like Moses did before he passed away. He's laying down some important ideas for them. The first thing that he says is you need to choose for yourself whom you're going to serve. You know, you want to serve the gods that your father served 
in the region before we got here? That's your choice. Now keep in mind, the blessings and the curse have come from that choice. So, or you can choose the, the gods of the, the people in the land that we're in now. But then he says something really cool here. And this is something that I think God, again, has woven into the fabric of the father dynamic. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He is speaking audaciously. He's speaking boldly because he's saying, not only am I going to serve, but my entire house is going to serve. I remember at a, a certain point, uh, as our children were, were getting saved, it, it was a, a steady progression one to the other. And um, one of our children was really struggling. Just, just was under a lot of conviction, was really uh, trying to determine, you know, how they were going to live their life. And they were talking with Christy as they were driving down the road. And, and uh, this child, just being very blunt and honest, said, what if I don't want to live like that? And Christy, being just as blunt, said, too bad. This is our house. This is our family. This is the way we do things. You will read your Bible. You will pray. You will go to church. Those are the things that are important in this family. And those are the things you will do. Okay? Now this was not a, a, this was not a contest of wills. It wasn't done in a threatening manner. It was an interrogative. It was a question. It's, it's going, okay, so what if I just don't believe these things? Well, too bad for you. Because in this house, this is what we believe. This is what we do. Now it wasn't too long after that 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 child came to the Lord. And that was that's a, a huge blessing to me because, you know, I, I had just had this mistaken idea that because our children were born into a family with Christian parents and we took them to church every time the doors were open and oftentimes opened the doors ourselves, I just assumed they were Christians. I mean, they listened to Christian music. They, you know, they read the Bible. They knew the stories. And, and I was shocked out of my glory when Benjamin called from from creation and told us that he got saved and boy was I gonna let Trevor have it. <laughs> boy, what are you what kind of nonsense are you putting in my son's head? And I was I was angry. I was I was not pleased. What 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 do you think he wasn't saved? What what gives you the idea he wasn't saved? And Christian and I talked about it and she kind of tried to rein me in. You know, and we still got a day and a half before they're home. We kinda of calmed the fires down and as we drove down here to pick up the kids, when I got back, I started getting angry again and getting frustrated. Man, the kids would get out in those stupid youth things and all kinds of weird nonsense happens. We come around the corner and we're pulling up to the church and Benjamin was pulling bags out of one of the vehicles and he turned around and looked at us and that wasn't my son. The God had completely changed his countenance. And all these things that I had done to say just would right out my brain. And, and it really gave Christy and I a pause. We had to step back and go, wow. All right, family meeting. Our family meetings always progress in the same manner. I sit in my chair. Christy sits over against the wall. The kids sit down and look fearfully from me to her. <laughs> <laughs> and they always start the same. I always say, your mother has something she wants to say. <laughs> and she always rolls her eyes and sighs. <laughs> I love consistency. <laughs> and we ask the children, just point blank, are, are you saved? Have you made a decision that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? And of, of the five children, only two answered yes. I was, I was floored. I couldn't believe this. I just assumed that they, they were saved. Guess what? We started praying. <laughs> Desperately. Oh God, save our children. You know, Christian and I pray every day for the salvation of our grandchildren. I love my grandchildren, but they need God. Lord, sometimes do they need God. <laughs> <laughs> and we were able to see, over the course of about two years, each of our children come to the Lord. And then, you know, it's one thing when you go to camp and you make an emotional confession because all the other kids are emotional and they're all confessing. But it's another thing when you can look back after four or five or six years and see the steady progression of maturity in, in, in their lives. So let's, let's look a, a little bit further here. Um, 
<clears throat> Psalm 127. Verses 3 through 5. Okay, this is, this is one of those things that uh, I think reveals the heart of God concerning children. It says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. You know, in, in today's society, I don't think we believe this. We, I, I don't believe that we really honestly believe that the children are a reward. We work so hard to plan out when they will come and how many they will come. And, and I mean, if God was standing before you today and said, I wanted to reward you, would you question the timing? But, but he says right here that they're a reward. And he says, uh, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Now, uh, just, just kind of to, to give you an understanding of what this means right here at the end. Uh, in the gate and the cities in, in Israel at this time, the gate was a meeting place. And they had, oftentimes, if the city was large enough, they actually had rooms built into the gate walls. And the people would meet in there, and, and oftentimes the elders would gather at the city gate so that they could pronounce judgment and, and rule on, on different things. And, and this is where a lot of the uh, ongoing activity took place. Now, think about this, you know, your enemy comes to the gate to contend with you, and, and it's not so much that the enemy's coming against the gate to knock your gate down. Your enemy is standing there in front of you with the accusation. Now, you got 10 or 12 of your strapping sons standing behind you, you have a lot more confidence before that enemy, don't you? Okay? Now, what, what David is saying here, what the author is saying is that, you know, when, when your enemy contends with you at the gate, when he comes against you, you're blessed when you have a lot of children. Why? Just because they can beat him up? I don't think that's it at all. Because what did it say right at the start? Children are a reward. So when you have a lot of children standing with you at the gate, it's very, very pointed that God has seen fit to reward you with those children, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. Anybody with fully functioning equipment, any man with fully functioning equipment can father a child, okay? That's, that's not being a dad. That, that's just being biological, okay? But a dad is somebody that steps in and walks with that child all the way into manhood. Now, I want to uh, point out a couple of things um, because we have some men in our church. Uh, I'm, I'm going to embarrass Matthew. I'm not trying to embarrass him. I want to commend him because Matthew doesn't have any biological children of his own. But I know Benjamin really looks up to Matthew. And, and Matthew has spoken very much into the lives of my sons. And, and you know, Matthew is, is one of those men that still waters run deep. When Matthew opens his mouth to say something, you know it's well considered. He's thought about it. He's thought it through. And I, I have absolute and complete trust in Matthew when my boys are working with him, that he is going to speak to them and, and they're going to be encouraged and they're going to be blessed. So I want to say thank you to Matthew for being one of those fathers. He's not a biological father at this point, but he is definitely one of those fathers that has stepped in and spoken into the lives of my sons. So let's, let's look a little bit further. Um, Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. Just kind of working our way through here. Now there are many, many more scriptures than what I'm reading here today. I'm just trying to kind of hit a flow here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so Solomon writes, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. I love this scripture. Um, you know, I grew up in the generation of Dr. Spock. You guys know who Dr. Spock was? Okay, my parents didn't either. As, as far as my parents knew, Dr. Spock was the guy on Star Trek. And the only thing he had of value to my father was the Vulcan death grip. 
<laughs> now my dad could do that. My dad would put his arm up, you know, around your neck and, and just kind of rest it there. And boy, you froze. You did not move. You hesitated to breathe because you weren't sure what he was going to do. Okay. So that's the only Spock my dad knew. The Dr. Spock of the 60s and, and the, the garbage that he espoused that completely debilitated and, and emasculated the, the discipline effectiveness of a father is, is just garbage. But see, Scripture tells us that if you love your children, you will discipline them. As a matter of fact, uh, before we had children, Chris and I sat down and we went through the Bible and we marked as many Scriptures as we could find where it talks about how to raise children. And did you know that all throughout Proverbs, that it, it reminds us, it warns us, it cautions us that if you love your children, you will discipline them. As a matter of fact, it even says that that with blows on the back. Give them a whack on the back. It will not kill them, but it will drive evil from them. Okay? I never whacked my kids on the back that I can think of, but I did whack them on the backside. You betcha. <laughs> they, they can all attest to that. The, the most feared words in our house were, get the stick. <laughs> okay? And the, the stick was always in one place except for about a year and a half. The stick vanished. <laughs> it disappeared. And it was found, much to Christopher's chagrin, at the bottom of his toy box. <laughs> He, he still swears to this day it was not him. <laughs> One of his siblings is trying to set him up. <laughs> but, but the stick always sat in the same place. And when it was determined that a child needed a squat, we would talk to the child first, and we would tell them, go get the stick. Now, they went to get the stick because that allowed us a few minutes to calm down. To, to realize that maybe death was not necessary. <laughs> it gave Christian and I a minute to talk and determine what course of action we were going to take. When the child came back with the stick, I tell you what, 90% of the punishment was done already. And then we would, we would take the stick and we would explain to them why they were getting punished. And then they had to tell us back why they were getting punished to, to, to identify what they had done wrong. Okay? And they got a swat. Now, if they were stupid enough to put their hands behind, their hands got whacked. But because I was aiming for the rump and not the hands, they had to move the hands and get another swat. Okay? Now, very rarely did my children need more than one. I can think of one incident. And I, and I won't tell you that it was Benjamin and Mackenzie. <laughs> but they got more than one because they finally pushed Dad to the point where you know what one is obviously not working. Okay, but but we had a, a process that we put into place to make sure we were disciplining and not just punishing. It's too easy to react out of anger and punish. But but Scripture reminds us. It says that look, as a father disciplines the child that he loves, so God disciplines us. That's the example. And if, if, if you're not disciplining them out of love because you want them to become better, then, then you've got to think, why are you doing this? Are, are you just lashing out in anger? Because the example that you are setting is the same example that, that they're going to receive from God. They want to look at that in the same light. Now let's, let's go forward a little bit further. Proverbs 23, verse 24. Uh, the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. Who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. I'll tell you, they're, they're one of the, the things in my life that I, I take tremendous uh, pleasure in and, and a little bit of pride is that all of my children are serving. Not, not, not just like themselves, but like they, they serve in the body of Christ. Uh, I, I admire greatly that my, my grown children that have grown out of them, living on their own, they have their families, they're all involved in their churches. They're all... Uh, they, they step forward when things need to get done to get things done. They all have a call that God has placed on their lives and they're all responding to that call by doing whatever God puts in their path to do. Now, one of the things here says, he who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Uh, one of those things that uh, you know, I, I struggle with is when your children grow up, you got to learn how the role changes as a father to a grown child. And, and 
Uh, one of the things that Christy and I really try to do is we try not to tell our kids how to run their families, especially when it comes to finances, because we did such a horrible job with our finances. But, but we had uh, one of our children that, that had this car fetish. And, and they would buy a car and have it for a little while, then get back and then buy a car and have it for a little while and get back. And we could just see the same mistakes that we made when we were first married and, and how that came to haunt us because of being oh so upside down on a vehicle that you have a, a vehicle that's worth $100 a month and you're paying $400 a month. And nobody's going to give you that much money for that car. And, and um, you know, we saw it was coming. We talked about it and determined, you know what? It's not our place to interject here unless they ask. God, would you please have them ask? <laughs> and they asked. And, and what we got to do is we got to share with them the experience that God had brought us through and the mistakes that we had made and the wisdom that God has in His Word as to how to protect yourself from these things. And, and it was a huge blessing to me because it wasn't just that they listened to mom and dad, okay? But, but they listened to what the scriptures say, and they set about rectifying that situation. And, and this day, they own their vehicle free and clear. And that was a blessing to me because that shows wisdom in my children. And, and that's something that you can't really give to them. I mean, you, you present it, but they have to take it and make their own, right? So, another, another verse. Um, um, Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 4. Now this is another one of these two-sided things that God presents to us, okay? Uh, Paul is writing to the Ephesians. Uh, the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, is, is kind of like the, the sister letter, the, the companion to the book, uh, the, the letter to the Colossians. Okay? And if you read through both of them, you see a lot of parallels going on. But what he says here, he says... Uh, Verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Okay? Now, there's, there's some question. I'm not going to try and get into today the difference between obedience and honoring. Okay? Um, that, that's something that we're going to talk about when we go over our family affair hopefully toward the end of this year, and we talk about the different roles in the family and how they God has presented those and, and how we're supposed to live those out. But um, honor your father and mother. But then see, this is the one side. We've already read this before. This is one of the first things God gives the nation of Israel is honor your father and mother. Okay. But then there's another side to this that Paul tags on through, through the leading of the Holy Spirit. It says, fathers do not... By the way, uh, just... The word fathers here doesn't just mean fathers, it, it means parents, okay? It's in the masculine form, just like we would say mankind, okay? Mankind includes men and women, okay? So it's the same idea here, okay? Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, okay? When we pray for our grandchildren's salvation, we also pray that God would give their parents wisdom and insight to train them up in righteousness. Okay? That the parents would be able to lay a foundation, just like uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, and, and they gave him such wise instruction and in righteousness that when the time of his salvation came, he knew what it was about. He knew, based on what he had learned, what needed to be done. And that's our prayer for our children as, as they start having children of their own, that they would have wisdom and, and, and train up their children in righteousness. And, and I love the, the, the loving discipline that I see my grandchildren getting. You know, um, like I said, it's too easy a lot of times to react out of anger and react out of, out of punishing. You have made me mad. I'm going to get even. All right, I'm going to show you what's the number one rule in our household, Benj? Don't piss that off. Don't. This, this came early. and <laughs> uh, I will rephrase. <laughs> Do not make that mad. <laughs> okay? Now, now, part of that rule was that if you make mom angry or upset, 
that violates rule number one. Okay? All of those other rules fall under rule number one, and you don't want to make me angry. Okay? But the, the thing that I see is that my children have a relationship with their children, where when they discipline their children, their children don't ever question that their parents don't love them anymore. It's not a matter of, oh my gosh, they hate me. No, they, they know that that instant, they were disciplined for a, a misdeed. The parent does not cease to love them. But the parent says, this is a line you will not cross. There are boundaries, there are guidelines. One of the amazing things about children is they will continue pushing and pushing and pushing until they know where that boundary is. And they want to make sure that boundary is secure. It's not going to move. Okay? That's why scripture says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't be wishy-washy. If you tell them this is not, this is not going to happen, don't let it happen. Okay? So, the, the first side of this, children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. The flip side of that is fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. Now, let me, let me add a caveat here for those of you kids that want to use that as an out. You're not the one that gets to determine if this is applying to you because in the moment your father disciplines you, you always think he's acting out of anger. Okay? Anger is something that the father knows. You, you feel that moment when you cross over from, okay, this is an issue that needs to be addressed, discipline needs to be administered, whether it be grounding, whether it be a spanking, whether it be whatever, you know, uh, one of the things that we got, <clears throat> Christy found very effective when the boys got older as uh, being teenagers, um, they got to the point where spanking them with the stick was not nearly effective for her as it was for me. So she made them do push-ups. <laughs> and they had to get down on the ground in front of her, and they had to count them off doing push-ups. And that, that brought two concrete things to their mind. One, mother is over you, literally. She is standing right over the top of you, counting them off. And two, doesn't matter how big you get, mom's word is still law. Okay? Because if, if dad comes home and finds out that her word was violated, you violated rule number one. Okay? See, I like being simple. Okay? But, but do not provoke your children to anger. Uh, we all fall into this in some way or another. It's something to be cautious of. But, but the clear delineation is, boy, if you're training them up in righteousness, they're going to feel like you're angry with them sometimes. Because they're going to want to do things that you know they shouldn't do. So, flow of Scripture. God reveals Himself to us as our Heavenly Father. God is established at the outset. How important the, the, the parent-child relationship is, specifically the father-child relationship. God encourages us to not just love our children, and we're told over and over again how important that is, but also to discipline them, to love them enough to discipline them, to make sure, you know, as Scripture says, as iron sharpens iron. We want to put them through the furnace so that all the dross is burned off and what comes forth is pure, right? And I want to say this, I'm, I'm wrapping up right now. I commend the fathers of this church. Having watched for almost 12 years how the men in this church are raising their children. Um, I, I'm going to embarrass Steve now. Uh, Steve and I talk a lot and, and we share things about raising our children. I have nothing but admiration for the way that Steve is raising his boys. Um, he spends time sharing with them. He reads, they read the word together. They do things together as a family. And, and I love the way, the relationship that he has with his children. These are two of the people that, you know, you ask a question about Scripture and they're going to give you an answer because they know the Word. And, and I, I want to commend Steve in that. And, and so many others. Dom. How many, uh, Dom has his daughter Elizabeth and she's another one that she knows the Scripture, she knows the Word. But Dom has taken so many other people, some of the young people in this church, and he's taken them under his wing and he's spoken into their lives. So I, I just want us to say, I commend the fathers in this church. Well done. Well done. Yes.